Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to talk about Acts chapter 22, verse 14. We're going to do a practical exercise in biblical interpretation. We're going to use a case in point example of a Calvinist who is having trouble interpreting it uh, with a little dialogue that happened. So this is a great opportunity to use this verse to examine both Calvinism, the presuppositions that it plants in people's heads, the bad methodology that it gives them, and we can take a look at biblical interpretation for ourselves all at the same time. If you enjoy this content, feel free to give us a, uh, some support via, via PayPal or Venmo. The description to do so is in the link below. Uh, you know, the content that you get here is not like content that you get anywhere else, and it takes time, resources, space, planning, and money in order to bring this about to make this happen. So if you want to see uh, content like this continue, uh, we appreciate the support, and also we're trying to stay ad-free at the same time. So, on... Uh, in a discussion group, a Calvinist posted this. An OP stands for original poster. So when you see me, when you hear me say OP, I'm removing the guy's name so that protect his anonymity. Um, so OP refers to the original poster. And his question was, how does the provisionist handle this verse? Acts 22.14. And he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and see the righteous one and to hear the message from his mouth. Now that's Paul giving a recount of his conversion experience or things associated with his conversion experience. I just almost created the same presupposition that he has when I said that. <laughs> of his calling experience, his interaction with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and, ro and stuff that was related to that. Okay. So right off the bat, we see a problem. Look at this. Look at this word here, provisionist. I'm trying to get this. So uh, there we go. This word provisionist. Um, I highly discourage people from using labels that define a proposition set. And there's the reason for that is because when you have a label that defines a proposition set, Calvinists are ideologically possessed. They do simulated thinking. They don't do real thinking. They have a formulaic script for their own beliefs, and they have a formulaic script to refute other beliefs. When you collect a whole bunch of conclusion propositions into a, under a label and you give it a name, that enables them to just develop a script to run against it, and then they keep being an NPC. Not having a label is one of the things that is needed to jolt them out of their ideological possession so that perhaps they can stop being ideologically possessed, stop being captive, and actually th actually think. Stop doing simulated thinking and actually do thinking. When we come to the issue of the four kinds of knowing, we have participatory knowing is the deepest kind, perspectival knowing, and then procedural knowing, and then the most shallow kind that is scalable, it's, it's very helpful, but it's also scalable and there's a lot of data compression with, with high fidelity loss, is propositional knowing. And that is our statements of truth claims. We claim something is true. God is a trinity, cats are mammals, rodents have long front teeth that continue growing. Whatever the statement is, it's a, it's a statement truth claim. And almost the problem with Western Christianity is that it is encapsulated in statement truth claims, and there is no other kind of knowing. So if you were to have a label, you don't want a label about the propositions because the propositions, just like in science, the propositions are no good unless you know the process that developed them. So if you say, God, we believe God is a trinity, that doesn't mean anything unless you can show me and walk me through the valid process by which you came to that conclusion, okay? So we just keep handing conclusions down, propositions down, generation after generation of Christians, and then provisionism, maybe all the, pro maybe all the propositions are correct, okay? But without the procedural level of knowledge of how those propositions were derived in the first place, they are worthless and they only perpetuate the deeper problem. The deeper problem is lack of the other three kinds of knowing, lack of procedural knowing, lack of perspectival knowing, lack of participatory knowing. And coming up with a new label to cluster conclusions that are deemed to be correct 
and to distinguish them from Arminianism and Calvinism and everything else is perpetuating the same problem that gets people ideologically possessed in the first place. Okay? And then I got somebody who keeps coming on the channel, oh, well, well free grace is a safe paradigm. No. It may have all correct conclusions. That's not the point. The people are not equipped to operate in propositional space. That's where they need to be. That's where the individual needs to be, who holds the beliefs or holds the, the practice. And that's also what will jar the mind of the opposition, people who claim to believe the Bible but don't, such as Calvinists. That's the only thing that will jar them out of their ideological possession. It cannot be ideological ideology versus ideology. It can't be that no matter how correct the ideology is propositionally. Because if you have a bunch of correct conclusions and you don't know the processes that got there, you're just one generation away from losing them all. And then everybody leaves the church and you wonder why. Because there's no procedural knowing, no perspectival knowing, there's no participatory knowing, that none of that exists. And so what, so what do you think is going to happen? The propositions get challenged, people leave the church, people leave the denomination, people swap over because because they're not prepared to deal with anything that is any deeper than just a set of statements that they're supposed to willfully affirm. We cannot keep perpetuating that. We cannot keep perpetuating that. If Christianity is going to grow and do anything, it's going to have to be with those of us who are concerned with the other three kinds of knowing. So you have a uh, ideological possession and something that just came up in a zoom session last night. It's pretty exciting. Somebody brought out, methodological possession, where you have a bad methodology and you don't even know it. And we're going to come across that in this set too. Now, as we're dealing with the passage, we're also going to be dealing with interpretation. So what we're dealing with today is we're trying to get into procedural knowing and ap apply procedural knowing to understanding scripture and not just reverse engineering post hoc rationalizations of, of propositions about what the verse is supposed to say, per our systematic theology, which we have assumed a priori before we even go investigate the scripture. That's where, that's what we want to do. We want to look into procedural knowing. The procedure of the inductive method is observation, interpretation, and application. The goal of scripture is to figure out what you are supposed to do as a result of being exposed to scripture. What is mine to do? Okay, this, this, Bible is prompting me to do what? That's the application. People confuse that with the interpretation. Observations, there are many observations, and that is the most fundamental thing. That's where you have to start. The observation phase is what does the text say? What does the text not say? And you're going to ask a whole bunch of questions in the observation phase. All kinds of questions. Who's talking? Who are they talking to? What is this word definition? What's the sentence structure? How many people were present? Are there any other passages that are like this one? Now, I've told this story before, but when I was taking hermeneutics at the University of Mobile, they had us come up with 50, 50 observation questions for one verse, and it was the shortest verse in the English Bible, which is Jesus wept. Had to come up with 50 observation questions. Like, that's the shortest verse in the Bible. How can you come up with 50 observation questions? Well, we, we you know, got study groups together. We figured it out, and we came down with 50. We came up with 50, barely by the skin of our teeth. Went back to class the very next time. The next homework assignment was come up with 50 more different observation questions for the same verse that could not be the same ones that were the first 50. And eventually we did it. And then you start to see, when you start to go through the process you start to see how much there is to know that you did not realize to look into. And there has to be some kind of forcing function to force you to investigate things. So, so the observation, so there could be a hundred questions that you ask about any particular two words, okay? I think in the Greek Bible, the shortest verse is rejoice evermore out of 1 Thessalonians 5. In the English Bible, John eleven thirty five 35 is the shortest one. And if you can ask a hundred observation questions and not duplicate any of them. That's the kind of thing that you need to force yourself to do when you're going through scripture. Now, what is the practicality of doing a hundred for every two words you come across? Practicality is not high, but you need to start slow, just like you're reading. Okay. 
You remember when you were four and five years old and you're learning how to read and you start off kind of slow and it's tedious and nobody wants to listen to it and it's hard for you. And But now you're pretty fluent, hopefully, as long as you didn't grow up in Alabama where I came from. <laughs> maybe you can, I didn't actually come from there from grade school anyway though, but maybe, maybe uh, you read pretty effortlessly now, okay? That's kind of what the interpretation process is like. We have to stop thinking that we need to interpret the scripture and come up with good conclusions, then forget the process and hold the conclusions. It's the other way around. We need to do it like reading. Get a good process that develops good conclusions, and then don't worry about the conclusions. Just keep doing the process. You see, if you can keep doing the process, you don't need to hold conclusions tightly. You can always regenerate them. If, if, you, if you are capable of, of going through the process in a sound fashion, you can always regenerate sound conclusions. You always can. And so you want to become fluent with the interpretive process, procedural knowing, which means you have to practice it, okay? And then there's a perspectival and participatory element to that too. You get together with other people and do it, distributed cognition, and then so you want to practice this. And the interpretation is the answer to all your observation questions. And your interpretation can only be as good as your observation is. And also during the observation phase, you want to make sure that you are not presuming anything the text doesn't say. And that's your presuppositions. Some people build entire apologetic systems off presuppositions. And they're doing things backwards, and that's why they will never see. They will never come out of the dark into the light. They will never wake up. That is not how things happen. You have to start with a blank slate, examine the evidence, and follow the evidence where it leads. Now, you have to, sometimes you have to have certain axioms. Even science has to rely on certain axioms. But the key is you have to know what they are, and you have to be able to operate both inside and outside the worldview that rests on those axioms. So the interpretation is the correct answer to all those questions. And notice it is the correct answer to the questions. Some people say, well, that's your interpretation. That's not mine. Or I heard somebody, this is always like fingernails on a chalkboard. I heard a preacher, well, he was reading in the book of James one time. And he said, this verse means that we should. <laughs> no. Means is interpretation. That we should, whatever what is he thought we should do is application. The verse does not mean that you should do anything. What it means is what the original author intended to convey to the original audience. That's the only thing it means. Now, it might apply that we should do X, Y, Z, but that is the application. That is not what it means. That could be how it applies. You have to keep those things separated. Noah in the ark. You know, God told Noah to build a big boat, full, fill it full of people and animals and stay on it for about a year. What does that mean? Well, that means that we should have faith and persevere. No, those are applications. What it means is that God, t God told Noah to build a big boat, fill it full of people and animals and stay on it for a year. That's all it means. That's the only thing it will ever mean. And that's the meaning. And that's the meaning of the text that you're looking at. I have a series on biblical interpretation. There were seven parts to the series, but I just noticed it looks like that I added this video about replacing dispensationalism. So there are eight uh, videos, and I might even add this, add this one to that playlist too, since we're talking about biblical interpretation. So we need to stay up to speed with the interpretation process so that we can operate our, our procedural interactions with the text and with other people are sound, and we're up to we're up to speed, we're up to practice, we're constantly doing these things. After you have a good interpretation, and you're, you, you remember your interpretation, even though there's a one good interpretation, doesn't mean that you can arrive at it, okay? So this is where confidence margins comes in and epistemology comes in too. You can actually have confidence margins where you could say, I think Paul is saying this, but I'm only 65% sure that's what he means. You don't have to be 100% on what your conclusions are. You can assign them a lower than 100% confidence margin. So you can say, well, I think maybe we're at you know 65 on this, but I'm not sure there's a couple, I need to, I need to, you know, mull this over and let it brew for a little while longer. And that's okay. That's okay. So with your, inter and so if you don't have good observations, you're not going to have a good interpretation. And your observations are what does the text say? And you're also intentionally excluding things that it does not say. And if you, unfortunately, 
you know, we think it's good if you're raised in church, but when it comes to biblical interpretation, it causes us to think a whole lot of things the text doesn't say. And, and identifying those and weeding them out sometimes can be quite a process. And um, it, it can take, I, I don't want to overwhelm you, but it can take a while sometimes to, to realize what that is and, and get used to that process. And then the application phase, if your, ob- if your observation phase isn't any good, your, appli- your interpretation won't be any good. And then if your however good your interpretation is, is, you know, that your application depends on that. So if the meaning, if you've put the most likely meaning of the text at a 65% confidence margin, then whatever application you pull from that will probably also have a 65% or less confidence margin that you are doing the right thing, or maybe less than that. What's the most important one? The most important one is observation. That's the most important one. And if you can get that one right, many times the rest of the stuff falls into place. Understand the difference between interpretation and application. Lots of observations, but there's only one good interpretation. Doesn't mean you're going to be able to find it. Doesn't mean you're going to have 100% confidence margin when you do think you've found the most probable meaning. And then there's application. There could be lots of applications, just the story of Noah and the ark that you could get hundreds of applications from that hundreds of, of things that you feel moved and inspired and urged to do because of the example that's in the text. Okay. And that's fine. But the meaning is one thing. So we don't want to separate and confuse those things. So that's a little crash course on those. We're in Acts chapter 22, verse 14. Over here, I have the King James Version because you know me. Over here, this guy in the OP, he is quoting the ESV. So because he's quoting the ESV, I have included it on the right-hand side just so we can see what the difference is. Sometimes when you're discussing texts in different versions, sometimes they are very different. So it's important to look and see what they are looking at because it might not be very close to what you're looking at. Um, and that will take the discussion into a new area, probably. I like, whenever I have Greek, I have found that Times New Roman makes it look better. There we go. So, Acts twenty two fourteen, and, you know, Paul is recounting his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see the just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Notice those things. And he said, over in on the ESV, God of our fathers hath appointed you. So I have a chosen, I have appointed for that word there. To know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the voice from to hear a voice from his mouth. Okay. So the voice, cho- the word chosen here, and appointed over here comes from the Greek word. Prokirizomai. Prokirizomai. Isn't that just a blessing? Isn't that just a blessing to hear a bunch of whole bunch of syllables that you're never going to understand? Doesn't that just warm your heart and warm your soul and make you feel edified? It's from uh, to handle for oneself in advance, to purpose, to choose, to make. Okay, now notice this is a Calvinist who posted this. And he's like, how do provisionalists handle this verse? Which means that he presumes it's saying something Calvinistic. Calvinists presume that people are chosen to be saved. Now, the chosen, later on, he's going to bring up Acts 13, 48. It's important to note that the word appointed here and chosen is not the same one that's commonly translated as appointed or ordained in Acts 13, 48. That's Tasso. It's not this one. And also the words for elect and chosen that usually show up elsewhere, like in Ephesians 1, 4, you have eklecto, you have eklegomai, and eklego, elect. That word is not used here either. So it's none of those words used here to begin with. But so using the inductive method, observation, interpretation, application, My instruction to this guy, and I'm going to walk through the dialogue here in a minute, but my instruction to this guy, if you want to know what God chose Paul for or to do or whatever, you can make a list and it's right there in the text. So let's make two lists. Let's make a list. Let's make a list out of what he was chosen to do in the King James. 
and let's make a list to see what he was chosen to do in the ESV, which is the one that he's using. Now, this is not a Bible version video, but I'm just showing you that there is his, what he thinks is true isn't in his version either. That's what I'm showing you. It's not a version thing here. The list of reasons for being chosen and appointed down here. So I'm going to ask my observation question. For what was Paul chosen according to this verse? Because that's the verse he asked about. Well, we have three things listed. To know his will, that thou shouldest know his will. See the just one and to hear the voice of his mouth. Three things. Now, Calvinists think Paul was chosen to be saved. Now, whether or not he was, that's not what this verse talks about. Maybe he was chosen to be saved. Maybe he wasn't. This verse does not mention that. Do you understand that? So that thou shouldest know his will. Is that about believing or being saved? Nope. To see the just one. Is that about believing or being saved? Um, is it possible for somebody to know the will of God and not be saved? Yes, it is. If any man will do his will, he will know of the Father and the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether it be of man. Okay, Jesus said that in John chapter 7. Anybody can know what God's will is. Paul even gives you a direct statement about what God's will is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, and in other places. So anybody who can read can see what God's will is. No problem at all. To see the just one. Lots of people saw Jesus Christ. Lots of people saw him. Not a big deal. The 12 apostles, more than 500 people, that's just after the resurrection. What about during Jesus' ministry when he's feeding 5,000 people and you know being crucified? A lot of people saw the just one. So do you ha does that mean you're saved? No. And hear the voice of his mouth. How many people heard the voice of Jesus speaking to them? A lot of people did. Does that mean they're saved? No. Okay. Over in the ESV, what's he chosen for? To know his will? To see the righteous one? To hear the voice of his mouth? Are any of those being chosen to believe, chosen to be saved? No, they're not. You say, well, Paul was chosen to be saved. Maybe you think that, and maybe you have another verse for that, but this one is not the one, you see? inductive method. We're just going with what this verse says. That's the deal. And you do that with every passage. And I'm not saying take it out of context. I'm not trying to say that. All right. And you'll see in the contents, con, uh, in the comments in a few minutes, what I recommend to do. Some videos that pertain to this. So I wanted to show you this in advance before we get into the dialogue so that you can see where my mind is with, with something like this, what my mind goes through. Because people ask like in the Zoom meetings, like what do you do to go through the interpretation process? And that's the interpretation process. I'm, okay, he's chosen for what? I'm going to make a list. What's he chosen? I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I'm going to start answering those questions. All right. So some videos that would pertain to this, and I recommended some of these to him. If you want to see about Paul, I have an entire video on why Paul's conversion disproves Calvinism. Go check that out when you get a chance. I have a, when it comes to the issue of election or the appearance of the words that have to do with election in, te in the text of scripture, this video here deals with every single one of them. Every single one. And the conclusion is that election is always to service, not to salvation. That's by looking at every occurrence of every appearance of these words. And I did it in public. There's a video. You can go watch it. And then there's election is nothing like you were told that goes more into what these occurrences mean. The interpretation side. I also have an Acts 1348 playlist. We're just dealing with Acts 1348. Got four videos on it that people can go watch. And so when I'm talking to people like this, sometimes I will post links to these videos so they can go watch for more information. And I wouldn't do that if they weren't mine probably. So I don't know how effective this is when you're talking to somebody else and you're posting somebody else's videos, but at least it's my material. And I, I encourage you to try that. I mean, go ahead and do it. Post the videos so people can see, hey, there is a response to this and people have thought through this. You know, some of these cage stagers act like we never saw these verses before. So my response to the OP, he says, how does a provisionist handle this? Of course, I don't want to make a big issue out of, you know, let's not use labels like provisionist because that only perpetuates the root problem to start with. But I just go ahead and answer the question. My, my issue is this. I said, appointment is to service, not salvation, consistent with the biblical view and is not Calvinistic. If God appointed or ordained all things that come to pass, it would just need to be stated once. It says seated there, but that's a typo. It would just need to be stated once at the beginning of the Bible and would never need to be mentioned again. 
Therefore, being informed that this thing was appointed is an indicator that there's no reason to believe something is appointed or ordained unless we are told so. Inductive method. No isms. So that's my response. So the original poster comes out and says, uh, Kevin Thompson, what about this? Now notice he's jumping to a different verse now. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So I'm like, okay, we're shifting gears here. You, you started off wanting to talk about Acts 22.14. Now you want to talk about Acts 13.48. Well, I'm busy. So here's my video on Acts 13.48. Here's my video playlist. There's four videos, all with 100% original content. I Meaning I'm not posting somebody else's videos. This is all my stuff, okay? And I try to include a little bit of information. For Acts 13.48, for example, as a teaser, notice that God is not the subject of any verb in Acts 13.48. Also compare with Acts 13.46 for immediate context in Acts 18.6 to see how the negative form of the word translated as appointed gets used there. See the videos for more information. Now in Acts 13.48 says as many as were appointed to eternal life believe. The King James says as many as were ordained to eternal life believe. I use appointed because he just posted this up here and I didn't want to be all confusing. All right, just referencing back to what he posted. But the word in Acts 13.48 is tasso. And in Acts 18.6, that's interesting because Acts 18.6 is a parallel to Acts 13.46. And in Acts 18.6, the word is antitasso. Tasso in Acts 13.48, antitasso in Acts 18.6. And it is not God doing it. So that's a little teaser that I pointed out. And of course, if you, I recommend if you want more information on Acts 13.48, go watch those videos. All right, And you might even start with the most recent one down here. And then go backwards from there. Because they're older. So he says, thanks, I will take a look when I get a chance. Now this guy is, uh, you know, some, some Calvinists are just like vitriolic and hateful. And, and this guy, he seems like a decent guy. You know, he's, he's got a question. He's stuck on a presupposition that he doesn't realize, but he's not being hateful or anything like that. So that's good. <laughs> so it seems like we can actually maybe have a fruitful discussion. Now he says, I watched the first video. You did not claim that appointment was to service and not salvation. Is that in the other videos or is that the question you are trying to answer? That was the question that led us here. I would be happy to discuss your general views of Acts 13.48 since I disagree with much of what you claim, but the question here was related to Acts 22. You stated that appointment of Paul in Acts 22 was to service and not salvation. So I said the playlist was with regard to Acts 13.48, which is what you asked about. He asked about Acts 13.48, right? If you want to talk about election, I have different videos on election, but he asked about Acts 13.48. Um, for election being to service, see these two videos. And that's the two videos that I pointed up here on the right-hand side of your screen. Election word occurrence analysis and election is nothing like you were told. So those are the two that I posted there. If you want to look into election being to service, <coughs> deal with every one of those right there. So go check that out. So he says, Kevin Thompson, you still contend that Paul's appointment in Acts 22 was to service only and not salvation. Now notice what he's doing there. I didn't say it was to service only. Well, the point that I'm making really is that let's stick with what the text says, right? Those things, you need to know something. You need to see the just one. You need to hear the voice of his mouth. That's service, right? So if you want to talk about election, that's why I was talking about election and appointment in the sense of election is in scripture is always to service. It's never to salvation. And I have a video dealing with that in public, dealing with every occurrence of every word. So I'm not saying that frivolously and I'm not using overarching terms. I've been down in the weeds on this. Okay. And not to salvation. So salvation, why is he saying not to salvation? Is it my job to say that it's not to salvation? When you look up here and you look at the list of things in Acts twenty-two fourteen, 14, is salvation in there? No. Does he want to put it there? He apparently thinks salvation should be included there. So if he wants to put something in the text, the text doesn't say the burden of proof for that is on him. 
Um, can you tell me where in the context he is saved? Well, I'll have an entire video on why Paul's conversion disproves Calvinism, and it goes into that in great detail and shows you when he gets the Holy, doesn't get the Holy Spirit until after he encounter, encounters Ananias. So he's actually not saved on the, on the road to Damascus. And he doesn't get Ananias until he prays. Okay, so it's, if he wants to, now, see now he's shifting topics again. Can you tell me, and I'm not saying he's shifting topics like to be sly and coy, but what I'm, what I'm trying to point out to you is that he's, he has combined a whole bunch of things in his head that he thinks are connected, that he doesn't realize he's thinking that because of his theology, not because of anything he ever saw in any Bible. Okay? So if you want to examine where in the text, where in the context he is saved, we can look into that. But what does that have to do with Acts 22, 14? If you want to know when Paul got saved, why are you looking at Acts 22, 14? Because that doesn't mention him getting saved. That's not about him getting saved. That's about him choosing to, to know something, to see Jesus Christ and hear his voice. That's what that's about. If you're talking about him getting saved, why are you in that verse? Okay? You, you would look elsewhere for that. We see his appointment as soon as he can see, even prior to baptism. Why would he be concerned about making such a distinction in the context? It is much more likely that his appointment at least includes his actual salvation. So he's saying it's likely. It's likely that his appointment at least includes actual salvation. Why, why do you think that's likely? What's your basis for saying that? It might seem like the default way of thinking, like why wouldn't you think that way? But why do you think that's likely? So then I posted this video again, Paul's conversion disproves Calvinism. But you see how many things he's, he's got, the, the Calvinistic presuppositions are, are clustering a whole bunch of ideas together for him that he can't untangle and he doesn't realize they're tangled. He doesn't realize they're not the same thing. Okay, and that's what that's how that kind of theology blinds you to the text, so that you you can't read it and understand it. Another reason why I tell people, like after the Cal, you get a Calvinist pastor who you you get on to him, you're like, hey, we didn't want a Calvinist pastor, and some Calvinist pastors will say, okay, I repent of being a Calvinist pastor. Well, they're so blinded by this kind of stuff, they got it all tangled up in their mind, like this guy does. They're not fit to be a pastor of any kind. When this kind of thing happens, even if they genuinely recant Calvinism, they need to go back into get some procedural knowing about how to do the inductive method and unsee all the junk they've been seeing for so long. And that takes time. I'm, I'm actually working on this thing where you have ideological possession and then that would be attachment, you know, emotional attachment to a set of propositions that are all interrelated together. And you can actually start to get insight to see your way out of that probably relatively quickly. But methodological possession, as somebody brought up in our Zoom meeting last night, that would take more time. How long does it take you to unlearn how to do something? To un unsee something? That takes longer. And there's more, there's more to it. I would, I would venture to guess that the types of possession as you go up the stack of the types of knowing are probably cubed in their level of difficulty. Okay? And now I'm trying to think what 3 times 27 is. <laughs> 27 times 27 times 27. Because if you have, you have one issue here, and then you would have three problems here, and then you would have nine things holding you back in your possession at this level. And then you would have maybe 27 things holding you back at this level, or maybe nine times nine, like 81, that kind of thing. I think it, it probably, the things that are holding you back, the more possessed you are at each level, probably the more entangled you are to an exponential degree is what I would imagine. And um, I just got introduced to that thought last night and I haven't been able to develop it much. So he says, uh, all right, we dealt with that. Kevin Thompson, if I listen to another one of your videos, will it tell me if you believe that Paul's appointment was Acts, in Acts 22 was to conversion or to service or both? Seems like it would be easy to just tell me what you believe. Your videos raise more questions, issues than they solve. Okay. So if he's asking about election, I got videos on election. If he's asking about Acts 1348, I got, I got videos on Acts 1348. But when it comes to Acts 22, 
it, let's just deal with that verse, okay? So he's asking about things that I already have videos for, and he sees them as connected, so he doesn't understand why when he asks about election, I show him a video on election, he doesn't understand why he doesn't answer his verse here. He sees it as connected. I don't see it as connected. So why? what does election have to do with this? What does salvation have to do with Acts 22, 14? He sees it as connected. I don't. So when he asks about election, he thinks he's asking about Acts 22, 14. Or when he asks about, asks about Saul's conversion, he thinks that has something to do with Acts 22, 14. He has those things all tangled up. It has nothing to do with Acts 22, 14. You want to know when Paul got saved, Acts 22, 14 is not going to be a major player in that, in that study. So I said, let's employ the inductive method. Acts 22, 14. Now, I like to do this to show people what the text does and doesn't say. I will, I will make a version. I will show the scripture on the left. And then I will make a version on the right-hand side, which basically states what they believe. I said, so up here, you'll notice that I say, which of these is correct? And in Acts twenty-two fourteen, and he said, the God of our fathers chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will, see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. Those are the three things right there. And over here, here's the presuppositions that I would presume a Calvinist sees. He hath chosen thee that thou shouldest be converted and be regenerated and shouldest get saved or believe or put whatever else you want there that the text doesn't say. And sometimes this jogs people's ideological possession to the point where they realize what they've been seeing in the text that it doesn't say. And it can be an eye opener. So I'm a, big, I'm a huge believer in doing scripture comparisons like that. So you can... Yeah. Yeah, there we go. I'll lean away so you can screenshot that and use it if you want to. If somebody brings up Acts chapter thir- uh, twenty-two fourteen, <clears throat> so I said Acts twenty-two fourteen is something that could be said to any and every Jew that was contemporary with the apostles. Think about that. Look at this verse. Anybody could know His will. Anybody could see the just one. Anybody should hear the voice of His mouth. That could be said to anybody who is contemporary with the apostles especially when Jesus was walking the earth. Could be said to anybody. The chosen and appointed is a different Greek word than the usual suspects, and I talked about that at the beginning. It's not eklecto, it's not eklegeo, etc. There are never, those are never to salvation either, but it's also important to note that it's a different Greek word than the ones in the Gnostic ideologues do, than the ones the Gnostic ideologues do all their clamoring about. In other words, the Gnostic ideologues, the Calvinists, are always about this eclecto and eclegeo and stuff like that. It's a different Greek word here. This one is prokerizo, all right, which is translated in 2616 is to make. To make. Interest, so that's kind of interesting. The semantic range there. Interestingly, with regards to Paul's service there too in Acts 2616, which in 26 it is also another telling of Paul's encounter with Christ on the Damascus road in Acts 26, 16. And the word there is translated to make instead of chosen. So that's interesting. And then he comes back and says, sounds like you are saying he is appointed to service only, correct? And, I, and I'm like beating my head up against a brick wall. I'm like, look, the text says he's appointed to or chosen for these three things. That's not me saying that. That is the text saying that. If so, where in the context is he saved? Is he, he is appointed as soon as he can prior to baptism. I think we already went to, did we already see this one? I understand which Greek word is used and that it can mean to choose for oneself. In this verse, however, it is clear that God is the one choosing, correct? Well, God, what's he choosing him for? He's not choosing him to believe or to be saved. The text doesn't say that. And this guy, this guy can't get that out of his head. So I asked him, Let's take this, um, what I'm trying to do when I ask this question, I'm trying to take it to the procedural level. What are we dealing with here? So I said, what method of interpretation do you employ? And he actually answers. A lot of Calvinists have no idea what they don't know. They don't even know the biblical interpretation is a thing, right? Um, so he said, not sure how to answer that. Does redemptive historical tell you what you are asking? Now, what he did, he went and Googled it because if you look up, Calvinists like to follow the redemptive historical method of interpretation, right? Now, I've had seminary trained Calvinists tell, be telling me this since 2015 that they follow the redemptive historical method of interpretation. They have no idea what the inductive method is. And 
the redemptive historical. That's all he says, redemptive historical. That is not a method of interpretation. That is a possible conclusion set from an interpretation. And it says redemptive in the methodology. <laughs> Do you see the problem with that? That is presuming that this is a this is not a this is not an interpretation methodology. This is a theme, a thematic imposition, is what it is. That's I think in other words, the presumption is I think the Bible is a historical rendition of God's redemption of man or redemption of the elect or whatever. That's basically what it is. That's a propositional statement. That's a conclusion. And to turn around and then you say, well, you know, some people say you, you need to look for Jesus Christ on every page. What they do is they, they take the redemptive historical theme that they presume is the theme of the Bible and then they try to read that back. They, it, they interpret every passage in a way that supports that, okay? That's eisegesis. That is, that is putting ideas into the text, not drawing ideas out of the text. And that's not his problem. He didn't even know that thing was a thing until he Googled it after I asked him. But the seminary trained Calvinists who are taught this, they are taught to start with a proposition of what the theme of the Bible is and then interpret all the text in accordance with that theme. That is not an interpretation methodology. That's an eisegetical methodology. That is to have, a, have an a priori set of ideas to start with and read those into the text. That's what's going on there. So I said, it tells me enough, because I've encountered this before. And um, <laughs> when he says, I'm not sure how to answer that, what does this tell you? I, I mean, that tells me that he went and Googled it and he doesn't even, he doesn't have a biblical interpretation methodology. and doesn't even know what one is. I said, it tells me enough. You seem to have the same hangups as other people who tell me they use that. All right. Same guy I've been dealing with since 2015 who talks about that. I said, you tend to be t thinking a lot of the same things that the text doesn't say. Not trying to be insulting or anything, just trying to identify the root cause. So let's shift over to the inductive method. So I'm trying to give him some instruction here. Take a look at Acts 22:14. Using only what is stated in the text, only what is stated in the text, make a list of things to and for which Paul was chosen and appointed. What winds up on that list? That's my question. Make a list. Just out of that verse, what's Paul appointed to? Now, once you've done that, do you have a good reason to add something to it that the text doesn't say? If so, what's the reason? And he wants to, he thinks it includes salvation. I'm like, well, the text doesn't say salvation. So what's your reason for wanting to add it? You think you have a good reason. Where does that come from? Does that come from some other verse somewhere? Is that, where does that come from? If you want to add it, you have to justify why you want to add it. And if you can't justify it, don't add it. So if you have something to add, like salvation or believing, show me where it is in the text. So he says, I get your point, I really do, but just hear me out for a minute and tell me where I'm going wrong. All the things identified in this verse are indicative of belief and service. Why does he say it's indicative of belief? Why does he say that? That's his presuppositions talking. That's his theology talking. He presumes that if somebody is chosen for those things, that it is automatically a prerequisite that they would also have to have been chosen to believe too. That's what he presumes. The text never says that. He says these, uh, all the things identified in this verse are indicative of belief. How do you know that they're not contingent upon belief? How do you know that? You see? How do you know that Paul wasn't chosen to do those things? And if he said no, God would pick somebody else and just leave him blind and let him die. How do you know that? You don't know that, you see? So when you want to add something to the text, the text lists three things. If you want to add something other than those three things, it's up to you to, to justify why you want to add it. So it's not indicative of belief. It's indicative of three things and only those three things and not anything other than those three things. That's all the text is indicative of. So he said, no distinction is made in this verse between belief and service. Now, why, why would the text need to make a distinction between belief and service? 
the text doesn't know that you are going to conflate belief and service to have to disambiguate them for you. You see, the text doesn't know that. The text is telling you three things, chosen the three things. He doesn't know that, the text doesn't know that you're adding a fourth thing and that you're going to keep adding it until the text tells you not to. You see, the text doesn't need to make a distinction because it does not lift, it does not list belief. It only lists three things and belief is not one of them. So the te- if, if you think that there is a lack of distinction there, that is up to you to justify why. But notice how he, sh- this is called shifting the burden of proof. Like he wants to add something to the text and it's my job to prove that his presumption, that his conflation of these ideas is not valid. No, 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 no. You want to conflate ideas above and beyond what the text says? That's your job to prove why that should be done. The text does not need to distinguish something. <laughs> like if, uh, mercy, I was trying to think of an example. Like if I told you to drink a, a glass of milk, right? And then somebody else says that he's poisoning you. Why? Because he did not distinguish the glass of milk from poison that he may have put into it. Why would I need to? You see, why? you are adding this idea into the text that isn't there. There's no need to make a distinction because there's nothing listed. You are presuming it has something to do with belief. He says, additionally, this appointment, this appointment comes before he is baptized and calls upon his name. You should also notice, well, first of all, God telling somebody to do something doesn't mean they're going to do it. Okay. Even after Jonah got spit up by the whale, that doesn't necessarily mean he, he could have gone and tried to run again. Okay. And there's other things, there's other times in the Bible, like Balaam actually has the spirit of God. God tells him to do a certain thing and he disobeys. So God appointing people to do things, telling people to do things does not mean they are going to do it. Like Ephesians 2.10, that we should walk in them because sometimes we don't. It's the will of God that you abstain from fornication, 1 Thessalonians 4.3, but 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, sometimes people do, okay? So Paul could easily be chosen and appointed to do a particular thing like Judas, I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Well, he doesn't do that, but he was chosen and ordained just like the other 11, didn't do it. So it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything that the purpose for which God is singling him out is identified before he's converted. That's kind of the case with anybody and everybody right now. The Bible's so full of instructions in the New Testament that anybody before they get saved already has their work cut out for them. You know, doesn't matter really more or less if it's bespoke to an individual or not. So additionally, this point, appointment becomes before he's baptized and calls on his name. And you should also note that Acts 22, Paul is saved in Acts 9. Acts 22 and Acts 26 contain retellings of his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And the chronologies don't match. And I'm not saying that like it's a contradiction. I'm saying that because sometimes when you retell a story, you give a shortened or condensed version of it in order to, because you have an audience and you don't have a lot of time to get into all the details, okay? So the chronologies, if you look in Acts chapter nine, so look, go look in Acts chapter nine and in 22 and 16 and compare all of them. And they don't all, 22 and 26 seem to kind of jump the gun a little bit and don't really, they're not intending to specify and nail down the chronology exactly. They're giving you the major overall points. And so if you're just getting from one of those and not from all three, you could come away with the wrong idea, but it wouldn't matter anyway, as far as this is concerned. I believe these are pretty good indicators that there's no distinction being made here between salvation and service. So so again, he thinks there, he is demanding of the text. I demand that there be a distinction between salvation and service, or I will presume they are conflated. That's his demand. Well, the text, look, God, Mr. Calvinist, is sovereign and does not have to meet your demands. You don't get to tell the Bible what the Bible has to say to meet your demands. And if you want to see something disambiguated or a distinction made between something, but the text doesn't see a need to do so, it doesn't need to do so. If 
<laughs> you are making the error of conflating service and salvation. And if you are making that error, the writer of scripture does not know you are making that error and there's no reason to make a distinction because if you were just reading the text, you wouldn't be conflating those things. You would just be reading what the text says. You wouldn't be bringing ideas from outside the text and putting them into the text. So he thinks it's a pretty good indicator. There's no distinction being made here between salvation and service and that the one who conjectures such a distinction has the burden of proof. Now there is your shifting of the burden of proof. It's my job. He has made the demand on the text. The text must distinguish these things. I will presume these things are conflated until the text distinct makes it distinct. And no, 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 no. If you want to presume they're conflated, it's your job to show that. I'm not presuming anything. I'm just going with a, what the text says me, uh, says to me. And when the text tells me that he's appointed to these three things, I have no reason to conflate that with something else. So the burden of proof is on you to show why those things should be conflated with salvation. I don't see it. It's not in the text. So what evidence do you have from the text that this appointment applies to only service? So you know how they're, notice how they're doing that. So this is my reply. And the red writing is me quoting him. The blue writing is uh, my response to what I'm quoting from him. He says... All the things, I, and the reason I did it this way is because it was too long to post. It'd be harder to see if I just did a screenshot like on the other ones. So I copied and pasted the text in here. I, he said, all the things identified in this verse are indicative of belief and service. I said, belief is not mentioned in the text. You have to validate the reason you are importing it. You are presuming something. He says, no distinction is made in this verse between belief and service. I said also no distinction is made in this verse between crack and meth or between Mary and lesbian Nazi hookers abducted by UFOs and forced into weight loss programs. Not every verse can be about everything. We let the verse tell us what it is saying. We do not give it demands that we presume it meets from an argument of silence if certain presuppositions we hold are not disambiguated to our liking, especially if they aren't even addressed or mentioned in the text. I mean, just the hubris of this guy putting demands on the text like that. Additionally, this appointment comes before he is baptized and calls on his name is what he says. I said, first, one must bring in all the chapters 9, 22, and 26 together to get the whole story. The chronologies aren't identical in all three. See my video when I talk about Paul's conversion disproves Calvinism. Talk about all this stuff in that video. Secondly, Paul being chosen for service could have rejected it. And then God would have gotten somebody else to do the work. Jews are called the election and enemies of the gospel in the same verse in Romans eleven twenty eight. They are still serving a purpose to this day, despite not believing. Cyrus was chosen to serve a certain function and did not believe. Balaam was chosen. He had the spirit convened with God and went to hell. Being chosen means nothing. Look at Judas. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. And Sennacherib. Look at all kinds of other people chosen to do certain things. And, uh, they weren't necessarily saved. And I said, God sent Ananias to Paul because he was praying. Where did I get that from? Acts 9, 11. Go into one's house, see this guy named Saul, for he prayeth. For he prayeth. Because he prayeth. Right there in the text. He says, I believe these are pretty good indicators. There's no distinction made here between salvation and service. And the one who conjectures such a distinction has the burden of proof. I said, no, the person converging these ideas without any reason from the text for doing so bears the burden of proof. Now, remember, we're talking about biblical interpretation here. This is a practical exercise in biblical interpretation and observation of the text. It is not my job to unteach you bad presuppositions that you can't unsee because you brought bad theology or you bought into bad theology, which negatively affected your thinking. The text says what it says. And if you lay more demands on the text than what it says, that is your problem, not mine. With the inductive method, we stop with what the text says. We intentionally do not presume anything. So he says, so what evidence do you have from this text that the appointment only applies to service? I said, the text of Acts 22, 14 lists three things. If you want to add to those three things, the burden of proof is on you. In the inductive method, we do not add to the text. We let it do the speaking. So that's my response there. So this is a, I think this is a good practical exercise case in point to see how the inductive method can be practically applied to separate out our presuppositions away from what the text actually says. 
So he says, <clears throat> Kevin, you're making a distinction between service and salvation. Neither is in the text. That is the issue. Can you demonstrate the attributes provided are not indicative of salvation? I don't need to, to prove they're not indicative of salvation. He needs to prove they are. You see? He's the one that believes that they are. I don't believe anything till the text tells me it. The text tells me he's chosen for three things. That's the only three things I'm going to put on my list of what he's chosen for. So it's like this, this um, along with the burden of proof, there's another logical fallacy where they keep trying to getting you to prove a negative, you know, like, they'll, and they'll just, they, you can throw out any proposition you want and they can keep you busy all day if you fall for it. And one of the famous ones is like, um, watermelons are blue on the inside until you cut them open. Prove me wrong. No. If you want to make the statement that watermelons are blue on the inside, you prove yourself right. I have no reason to believe that. You see? And that's what he's doing here. He wants me to, dispr to <laughs> disprove a, a propositional claim that he's making. No. I don't, it's not up to me to disprove his... Can, can I demonstrate that the attributes provided are not indicative of salvation? I have no reason to believe they are, just like I have no reason to believe the inside of a watermelon is blue. No reason at all. Can you show that this appointment did not come? Notice that's another prove a negative. Like he's asserting a positive. The appointment came before his confession. That's his assertion. I'm supposed to prove it didn't. That has nothing. Yeah. He, the burden of proof is on him for making the positive claim. Quit hiding behind your grandstanding and answer the question honestly. I'm not doing any grandstanding. I'm actually sticking to the inductive method. I don't know why he would call that grandstanding. So I said, you are coupling service with salvation, which isn't in the text. You're conflating those ideas. Can you demonstrate that these things should be added to the text or automatically coupled with something else or that they weren't contingent? You are the one who wants to go beyond what the text says. Therefore, in other words, up here, like there's other ways to see this. You are the one who wants to go beyond what the text says. Therefore, the burden of proof is on you to justify doing so. He says, I'm just not that interested in repeating myself. You have a great day. I'm sure we will speak again unless I get booted. Now, what's he doing there with this comment? Unless I get booted, he's trying to play the victim card. Like because I'm speaking, he's in a soteriology discussion forum that discusses Calvinism, which is not administered from a Calvinistic perspective. So he's trying to play the victim card. Like if I voice a non-Calvinistic viewpoint or, or, or a Calvinistic viewpoint, I'm going to get booted like a persecution complex kind of thing. Okay. So you got to watch out for that. Remember people along with virtue signaling, a lot of people conflate victimhood for virtue and you have to watch out for that. Like, I'm just virtuously, try I'm just trying to preach the gospel and they're trying to get me kicked out of the church. Or when you see a woman in a battered, in a, in a battered wives and children's shelter, you assume that she's the, oh, you poor thing. You know, what happened to you? Well, she's probably not innocent either. And I'm not saying they're, they're all that way. I'm just saying that we presume virtue when we know that somebody is victimized, all right? So if you see a, a, like a woman gets attacked, that's a horrible thing and she was victimized, but maybe she stole $4 billion from somebody and embezzled it or something just a day before. So just because somebody's victimized doesn't mean they're perfect. You know, maybe they went and protested some great cause somewhere and the police sicked the dogs on them and that's the poor thing, you were victimized. But, but then you find out they're also a child molester, okay? You cannot... Do not fall for the trap of thinking that victimhood equals virtue. They were burned at the stake, okay? That's horrible. They're victimized. That's not cool. It doesn't mean anything else in their life necessarily was good. Maybe they were brave. Maybe they stuck to their guns. But it doesn't mean they were brave and stuck to their guns about the right thing. All right? Uh, so I said, no need to repeat yourself. The procedural error you're making is that you are putting the burden of proof on someone else to disconfirm one of your theological presuppositions. The proper thing to do in your case would be to identify that presupposition and suspend judgment on it or eliminate it altogether until you find something in the text that reintroduces it for consideration. 
In the inductive method, we do not add to the text, we let it speak for itself. The error you're making is procedurally identical to the Catholic who justifies praying to Mary because the Bible doesn't say not to. Now that's what you're gonna, if you ever talk, talk with Catholics, and you're like, you know, why do you pray to Mary? You shouldn't pray to Mary. And they will say, you'll come across Catholics say, well, the Bible doesn't tell us not to, you know? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us not to do cocaine and meth either, okay? <laughs> the Bible doesn't have to say not to do everything you can possibly think of, and you don't make a list of all the things you want to do and, and then scour the Bible to make sure it doesn't forbid them. I mean, following Christ and following scriptures to see what it does say and to do what it does say, all right? It's a positive affirmation thing, not a lack of negative. It's not an argument. It's an argument from silence thing. Well, it doesn't say not to. I just human trafficked 14 people. The Bible doesn't tell me not to. <laughs> the error you're making is procedurally identical to the Catholic who justifies praying to Mary because the Bible doesn't say not to. The Bible doesn't need to say not to because it never told you to in the first place. So if you're just following what scripture says, you would never come across a verse that says pray to Mary. You come across something outside scripture that says that, but you never come across anything in scripture that says that, okay? So if you're only adding to your to-do list things that scripture says to do, you'll never come across one that says pray to Mary. And if you're just adding things to the list that Paul was chosen for, you'll never come across one that says for salvation or belief. You'd never come across that. Text doesn't say it. I'm making the same interpretive procedural error here. And then they put the burden of proof over on the non-Catholic to find a prohibition against the practice that they've added. In other words, they put the burden, they shift the burden of proof. You need to find a verse that says we shouldn't pray to Mary. No, I don't. You need to find a verse that says we should. Shifting the burden of proof. So it's riddled with procedural error and logical fallacies. What you're doing, while the propositions are different, is practically identical to what the Catholics are doing in that case. And then... He says, thanks for the advice, brother. You have a great day. Now he's trying to, he, he has nothing to say and he's just backing out. So I said, I also encourage you to look into another logical fallacy you're making called shifting the burden of proof. In this case, you're presuming that being appointed to believe and being appointed to serve should be coupled as the default presumptive starting point. Now notice I'm saying default presumptive starting point. Like that's the default position. Like we should default presume that he was chosen to be saved until you can prove otherwise. Where'd that come from? Where'd the default presumption come from? See, where, what's up with that? Where'd you get that? You didn't get it from the Bible. Where'd you get it from? You see? And then you try to shift the burden of proof over to me to dislodge that default presumption. All right, so that's not the default presumption. Maybe you think it is in your Calvinistic mindset, but my default presumption is that we only go with what the text positively states and we don't add anything else to it. But in reality, it's up to you to demonstrate why your presumption should be considered a default starting point. You are getting that presumption from your theology, not from the text, and you are reading it into the text. And I actually posted this picture where what shifting the burden of proof is, and that is a special case argumentum ad ignorantium is the fallacy of putting the burden of proof on the person who denies or questions the assertion being made. The source of the fallacy is the assumption that something is true unless proving otherwise. Like he's assuming that the cho being chosen is to salvation and service unless proven otherwise. No, that's the shifting of burden of proof fallacy. No, he ha if he wants to think they're the same and that they're included and that they're not distinct, that he, ne he needs to make that case, not put it on somebody else. Now, this is a different poster. Now, this poster, I'll be honest with you, there's a whole bunch of names, and if I don't see a face and a name and talk to somebody, I can't remember who's good guys and who's bad guys, <laughs> okay, or, or who's Calvinist and who's a Bible believer. It's not exactly... So I don't know if this person was for or against. I wasn't sure. But anyway, this is a good... As far as biblical interpretation is concerned, this is also a good comment in the same thread. This person says, so what you're saying is that any time something is appointed, it is a deviation from the norm. Otherwise, why make a note of it? Anytime something is appointed, it's a deviation from the norm. In other words, every time you come across something in the text that says it's appointed, that it's a deviation from the norm, like the presumption is normally the appointed is this, this, and this. 
but we're going to presume this is a deviation from the norm. Well, how'd that norm, where'd you come up with that norm from? And that goes like back to the default position. Where'd that come from? And so, and then the anytime thing, no, we don't have, we don't have an anytime rule for any particular words popping up. We follow the same methodology. We don't attach doctrines to words. And anytime the word appointed shows up, we do a certain thing with it. No, we interpret every word in the context in which it appears as if we've never seen it before. That's what we do. That's the inductive method. That's the process. That's a procedural knowing. So I addressed this person. I said, first of all, you'd need to clarify how the norm was established in the first place. What you consider to be a norm is most likely a presupposition that you normally read into the text, not realizing how often the norm you presume is absent. In other words, that norm isn't the norm you think it is. You think it's a norm because of your theology, but it's not, it's not there. You might presume somebody's being appointed or chosen to salvation every time you see those words, but you never examine the text. You think that's the norm. It's not. It actually isn't. Secondly, there is no any time rule for any occurrence or any word or concept. There is not presumption that can apply to every, there is no presumption. I said not here, but no, it's a typo typing from my phone here. There's no presumption that can apply to every occurrence that goes against inductive methodology and that presumption. In other words, I can't have a set of rules or doctrines or beliefs associated with the word ap appointed. And then every time the word appointed shows up, I import that into it. No, 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 no. That's eisegesis. That's the problem with Calvinism. That's how the, every time they see words like elect or, you know, pre, uh, predestination or any of those words, they, they import all kinds of doctrines into that word, irrespective of the context. That's the opposite of what we want to be doing. We want to import anything into the text. Just let the text tell us what it's trying to say. So I said, we're to examine the text and interpret each word in the context in which it appears every time we encounter it. We are not to build up doctrines associated with certain words and then read those doctrines into the words. We are to consider each text and context very closely, being careful not to read our presumptions, traditions, or doctrines into the text, regardless of how default or normal they may seem to us. And that whole question up here, a deviation from the norm, shows me the way they're thinking. They think something is the norm, which they have no basis for thinking it's the norm. And then they do, like this anytime, they follow scripts. They follow a, a paradigm. They're ideologically possessed. So every time the word appointed shows up, they, this is what they do with it. Every time it shows up. And they think that we do that. No, we don't do that. And the whole, the whole label provisionism reinforces that. It reinforces that presumption that since we're following a, a propositionally labeled paradigm that since they are, we are too, so that we're doing the same thing they are because we have a label that des describes our propositions that we're bringing those propositions to the text with us because that's what they do. They think that we're doing that. That's why I'm against a, a label that defines a set of propositions. Maybe a label that was associated with a process would be better, like inductivist or something like that. So I said, if we determine our doctrine prior to examining the scripture, then what is scripture for? <laughs> you know, where'd that norm come from? And if you bring in this norm to every appearance of the word, where'd that norm come from? And if you are determining what the text means before examining the scripture, then what's the scripture for? Shouldn't your, shouldn't the scripture be the authority and it tell you how things are and what to believe? But here, what we have here is people are bringing their theology to the text and they are telling the text what it's saying. Well, if that's the case, why even have a Bible to begin with? You got it all figured out. Got it all figured. Why are you even consulting the Bible? Why are you even if if you're not going to just stick to what the text says, why consult it in the first place? Y your mind is already made up from external ideas. Just wallow in those. Don't pretend to be getting stuff from the text when you're telling with the text what it can and can't mean to begin with. Let the text tell you. Then this person says, we have to do, we have to undo a lifetime of thought conditioning, which made me reconsider. Maybe this isn't a Calvinist. Maybe this is because a lot of people think Calvinistically, even when they're not Calvinist, that's how they become Calvinist later because they have all the same cult, you know, premise vulnerabilities in their mind. 
And this is correct. This is absolutely correct. We have to undo a lifetime of thought conditioning. That's right. So this, a deviation from the norm, that's a thought conditioning thing where you think a certain thing is a norm before examining the text. And then this anytime thing is a thought conditioning thing where you think that certain words should be treated a certain way every time they appear. That's eisegesis. You should not do that. So we're at the end of the thread there, at least as far as it went. I think this thread is pretty fresh. But it was a it was a great opportunity to talk about the inductive method and how we should approach the scripture using the inductive method and how it relates to the four kinds of knowing. We want to, this is a process. The inductive method is a process. It is not a set of propositions. And it's just like what our video down here, replacing dispensationalism, it is... See if I can highlight that for you real quick. It is not a set of propositions or beliefs. It is a, it's a process of going through, asking all these questions, noticing, and all that is is an expansion of the inductive method where it focuses on where you are on the timeline, the Toreo method that we laid out in that video to replace dispensationalism. You don't, you, there is no set of, propositions that you follow called dispensationalism. There is an awareness of where you are on the timeline in scripture, what events have already happened, what events have yet to happen in the text in which you're reading, and what that implies, and what uh, transitions have occurred and what transitions have not occurred. It's a, met it's, it's a methodology of, of awareness, of becoming aware of these things and letting that awareness inform the meaning so that it can inform the application for you. It's a methodology. It's not a set of propositions. And we got to get that. We got to get that. So if we had a label, it would have to do something with the procedures that we follow, not the conclusions that we propose. That's very important. So maybe an inductivist. He's not a provisionist. He's not a Calvinist. He's not an Arminian. He's an inductivist. Well, what does he believe about this text? I don't know. We need to examine it together and go through the inductive method on the text together. And then we will find out what he says this time, <laughs> you know, because you're constantly enhancing your procedural knowing, constantly getting better at it. And the thing that you decided 10 years ago, you might think wiser of it now because you've gotten better at the procedural method of the, in of the inductive method the procedural knowing associated with the inductive method. I hope that helps. Remember, this is a practicum in biblical interpretation and examining Calvinistic presuppositions using the text of Acts 22.14. I hope it was helpful. Let me know in the comments. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.